Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, it's part three of the history of Windows Task Manager. I'm Dave Plummer, its original author. I'm going to take you on a behind-the-scenes tour of the never-before-seen original source code to the Windows Task Manager. Welcome to part three. It's time to look at the actual Task Manager code to see if anything I did back then is informative, instructive, or at least entertaining. And it's not just any code, but old-school C++, complete with virtual destructors and pointy edges and everything. So grab a helmet and come along for the ride. The code we're about to delve into represents the Windows Task Manager as it stood about when I retired, right after Windows XP and Server 2003. I had not actually seen the source code at all since then, until it came time to prepare for this presentation. I have a pretty good memory for code, and I thought I remembered most of Task Manager well enough that I would only need to look up some finer points. But I was sorely mistaken. What I did remember was still true, but it's much larger and more complicated than I pictured it in my memory. I thought we could skim through the whole thing and I'd give you some commentary on it, but at 22,703 lines of code, that's be about 350 printed pages. So that would hardly be possible or practical. Now that my memory is suitably refreshed though, my plan is to first give you the thousand foot view of the project as if you were a new member on the team, just getting your bearings. Once you've got the big picture, we'll dive in and check out some of the highlights and details. Believe it or not, Task Manager is the only time in my entire Windows career that I had the opportunity to create a new main for an application in the product. Even zip folders was a DLL extension that lived inside the Explorer's process. It was also one of the few times I wasn't inheriting a bunch of legacy code. Task Manager was entirely fresh and new from module entry to exit process. And believe me when I say that's a rare opportunity, or at least in my experience it was. Seen from high above, Task Manager is a standard Windows app, which means that it has a main window and a message pump. Within the main window is a tab control that in turn hosts a set of page objects, such as the performance page and the task page and the user page. The pages all inherit from a base class, cPage, that provides surprisingly little commonality between the pages. There are seven pure virtual functions that handle common actions, such as being created, activated, updated, and destroyed. Other than their preferred text title, the pages provide nothing back to the host and operate as little black boxes of their own, doing their drawing and so on without help or involvement of the main program. The only thing the main window provides to the pages is the refresh interval event so that all the pages update at the same time instead of independently and randomly. The process page is the most complicated of the set, coming in at about 5,000 lines of code. Or as IBM used to say, it's about 5k locks. Most of that is related to the ability to enumerate, interrogate, manage, and terminate processes. Task Manager updates every second or two, but it will actually update continually if you hold down the refresh key, which is F5. They've throttled the refresh rate in the current Task Manager, but the original had no such restriction. I'd love to see how fast it could scroll today on modern hardware. In any event, for each and every update frame, each page refreshes all of its data. So the performance page gets the CPU usage, the process page enumerates all the processes, and so on. Each page then very selectively reviews its data and compares it to the last frame so that it knows precisely what has changed and what has not. It updates the view with a goal towards limiting any unneeded drawing whatsoever. The pages all use a common approach to keep track of what has changed in the system from one update to the next. For example, for each and every process that is running, Task Manager knows not only what all the current performance data is for that process, such as memory and thread count and so on, but also which metrics have changed since the last frame and which have not. That allows it to refresh only that process information that has actually changed from one update frame to the next. Now that should be enough of the big picture that we can actually jump into the Visual Studio Code Editor and have a look at some source. As we do so, keep in mind that other than going through it once to jog my memory ahead of time, I'll be looking at it live in the editor with you, speaking extemporaneously, making mistakes and incorrect recollections as I go. So please humor me a little bit as we turn our attention to main.cpp, where it all begins and where it all began. Our program begins at a function named module entry, which is where the linker has been told to tell the loader to start execution. The first thing it does is to call security init cookie. It sounds devious, but it actually just places a special cookie value at the end of fixed memory buffers so that buffer overruns can be easily detected. If those cookies are ever missing or corrupted, it knows immediately that memory has been damaged by a bug and that it's potentially a security hole. You might be thinking a Windows program normally starts with WinMain, but there's actually additional work that needs to go on before main. After all, if you think about it, how do your constructors run on global or static objects if execution were truly beginning with WinMain? It's not magic, someone or something must be calling that code. And that something is the CRT, or the Compiler Runtime. 
It injects into your code a table of function pointers that represent things such as your global constructors. Normally, the true entry point to your program is a stub function such as module entry that does this work before calling main. It's all behind the curtain, but because I opted to save space by eliminating the CRT, I had to do it manually in the code. Odds are, this is the first time you've ever seen how the sausage is made, and it's not pretty, so I'll keep it brief. Right above our module entry are four linker sections that even the comment refers to as ridiculous, so don't worry about the details, but that's where our tables of function pointers will live. We then have a function called init term that walks those tables and calls all the initializers. With that done, it then calls when main and execution of the program begins as normal. The first thing when main does is try to manage the single instance problem by looking for a running instance of Task Manager. If it finds a candidate, it uses send message timeout to send a private challenge message to that window and waits for a response. If the right response comes back, it activates that existing instance and then just exits. In all other cases, a new task manager proceeds to launch. You can also see here my least favorite registry key, the one that optionally disables task manager. If you've ever been denied task manager in a school or library or similar, this is the policy line that the administrator has set in the system registry. In the normal case, task manager now goes about its business of creating the task, process, performance, and other pages. To be on the safe side though, it first creates just the task and process pages. It then checks memory, and if memory is low, as in under 8 megabytes, it goes straight to work without creating any of the fancy performance graph pages or similar. You get a simpler task manager that is still able to perform the process management that you likely need to fix whatever is going wrong. If you've just been through a college degree in computer science, you're likely horrified by my use of GoTo. After all, you've been told your entire life that GoTo is evil, and yet I'm here to tell you that that's not entirely true. Convoluted execution is evil, and spaghetti code is too, but the use here is akin to raising an exception that takes execution to the cleanup label. There, any allocations are unwound. This approach is far more compact and easy to read and follow than a deeply nested structure of conditionals that unwinds on its way back out. I've done it both ways, and after decades of consideration, I'm here to tell you that if you're not using actual exception handlers, this is probably the cleanest way I've found to manage unwinding complex resource allocations, at least without smart pointers. Because I was a young man, just two years out of school when I wrote this code, some of my comments are perhaps a little too clever. In the cleanup case, this one reads, yes, I could use virtual destructors, but I could also poke myself in the eye with a sharp stick. Either way, you wouldn't be able to see what's going on. I'm not entirely sure what I meant, but I think I preferred tearing down the classes explicitly by name rather than in a loop going through the pointers where you don't know from reading the code which class destructors are actually being called. This is sort of a pedantic approach to making the code very obvious as to what it's doing, but it's not likely how I'd approach it today. Live and learn. Task Manager places a high priority on responsiveness and never hanging, but there are certain system calls that can still unfortunately block for a long time. One such example is the function for exiting windows. Depending on the circumstances, it can take a long time to return control to the caller. Because I do not want to block the main UI thread for Task Manager at all, the solution is to spin up a separate thread and invoke the API on the new thread. That way, if the API blocks, the Task Manager application is still free to continue. When the API finally returns, that's when the exit windows functionality will actually be invoked. You might have noticed the use of a class called C Privilege Enable. A privilege is like the right to use the webcam or power off the system. It's good security practice not to enable any privileges that you are not actively making use of. And to that end, this class is just a helper that I wrote that enables me to turn on a privilege and then have it turn off automatically as soon as we leave that function scope. As a rather brutal fallback option, which may have long since been removed, I see that holding down the control key while selecting the shutdown menu will pretty much instantly flush buffers and power off the system right then and there. And speaking of shutting down the system, that's a good example of two ways that an application can be written. In the first case, you provide a menu for shutting down, and if the user lacks the privilege to do so, they get an error message when they try. The better approach is to adjust the user interface to reflect what they are able to do before they can even try. So, for example, if the user doesn't have the rights to hibernate the system, then we shouldn't even offer them that choice. There are exceptions depending on the type of application, but that's the approach that Task Manager takes. As you can see, checking on such things proactively can be complicated. I'll just take a quick skim through the shutdown menu creation code, but it'll give you an idea of how much work and forethought goes into even displaying a simple menu item sometimes. The first steps within this function will simply be to set up the actual user32 menu resource that needs to encompass all the items that could be on it. Once the menu has been created, Task Manager uses a combination of looking at system registry keys and system policy 
in order to determine what privileges such as shut down, enable, hibernate, reboot, and so on will be presented to the user on the actual menu. Of course, even if it gets any of this wrong, worst case is an error message, it's not going to give you a privilege that you didn't have in the first place. Task Manager stores all of its settings in a C Options class. That class has an all-important ability for resiliency, which is that it can restore itself to a useful factory state at any time. Not just zeros, but default options that work together as if new. Whenever options are loaded, everything is also validated fairly carefully. Imagine a case where you had a large monitor, park Task Manager to the right side of that screen, but then switch to a smaller monitor before the next time you started your system. That would break a lot of apps because the window is now saved in a position that is off screen. That's the kind of thing that Task Manager validates against. You can force a reset to defaults by holding down Control, Shift, and Alt as Task Manager starts. If you can manage to get those keys down before it loads its options, this bit of code will see those keys and force a reset to defaults. Now let's turn our attention to taskpage.cpp. A task is different from a process in that a task is simply any top-level window with a caption bar and a few other characteristics. To enumerate tasks properly, one must first enumerate all of the window stations. Microsoft Windows allows for multiple users to be logged in at once, whether through the terminal server sessions or the local consoles. Each session has its own window station. Each window station can have an arbitrary number of desktops, and each desktop can have many windows. To find all the windows in a system, you must enumerate at each of those levels. One complication is that any thread that has created UI resources is then bound to that window station. That means our main thread, the one on which we are currently running on, is not allowed the ability to jump around and do window station enumerations in the first place. That, in turn, means we must create a new thread that is free to roam and wait for it to complete its work for us. It's a weird case where we're using a separate thread to do synchronous workloads. Once the tasks are enumerated, each is represented in memory by a C-task info structure. It contains attributes for things you'd expect, like window title, icon, and so forth. To keep track of which columns of which tasks have actually changed from one refresh pass to the next, a set of bit fields keeps track whenever an attribute is changed. By checking the union of those bit fields, you get an overall indication of whether anything has changed. The process page is the most complicated of the pages. It follows the same general strategy as the task page, but has many more columns as processes have many more attributes than do tasks. One frequent need that Task Manager has is displaying numbers, particularly large values, with commas. In order to be able to accommodate negative numbers in any number base and other such niceties, it looks like my friend Brian added a function to do so. Building on the standard NT libraries, which include a function called RTL in 64 to Unicode string, he naturally named it my MyMobeta RTL in 64 to Unicode string. The process page does one thing that turns out to be essential to its mission of minimal painting. It does a live merge sort of incoming process data with the existing list and marks only new rows or changed columns as needing updating. Essentially, it takes the old list and the new list and matches up what it can, deletes what it can't find in the new list and adds new rows as they appear. And finally, we'll take a quick look at the performance page. It's the one with the charts and graphs and which has evolved the most in the last 20 years or so. We've all seen the little graphs in Task Manager, so let's go look at some comfort code, the code that draws the graph paper background. It does exactly what you think it does. It steps from top to bottom, drawing horizontal lines every 12 pixels, and then right to left to draw the vertical lines. The only complication is that you need to shift the vertical lines according to the current scroll position. To draw the actual graph, you can see it steps through the last history values up to 2000 deep in the original version, and does a simple move to and then line to to draw the jagged line chart. That's right, it's turtles all the way down. Then finally, it blitz it from an off-screen bitmap onto the screen all at once. Why? You guessed it, to prevent any flicker. Well, that's probably a good place to end this high-level overview of the code. If there's sufficient appetite for more explanation or detail on the code, please let me know in the video comments. I'd very much appreciate it if you enjoyed this look back at the Windows Task Manager that you share this video with someone you know that actually likes such things. Odds are, if you enjoyed this video, then you know somebody that's kind of in the same vein and will also enjoy the video, but they may never run across it. So to the extent you can forward along to them, I really appreciate that kickstart. Share it on Facebook, put it on Twitter, whatever you need. It's a very narrow niche, obviously, so I'm entirely dependent on your shares and word of mouth. Can a Task Manager video even go viral? Not without your help, it can't. So text or email someone the link to the video, or you could click on the share button in the toolbar below the video, even if you've never clicked on it before. It won't bite, it won't hurt, so give it a try. Consider it your personal growth and good deed for the day. I know I'd certainly appreciate it. If you'd like to see future installments, do be sure to subscribe to Dave's Garage and turn on the bell icon and personal recommendations. If you found today's Task Manager Tales informative or entertaining, 
please leave me a like on the video. If you did not, consider sending me a strong message by clicking on dislike twice. That will really get my attention. If you've got any questions, fire away in the comments. I'll do my best to answer. Thanks, and I'll see you next time here in Dave's Garage. And finally, just to be clear, I retired from Microsoft more than 15 years ago, and while they graciously provided certain permissions that made this video possible, I'm not an official for them and nor am I a spokesperson. All opinions herein are mine only. Cheers! This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage.